Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your presence. First of all, my apologies for being a little bit late on this uh, hearing organized by uh, the Alliance of Liberal and Democrats uh, on uh, the issue Russia after the elections, what's next? And uh, we have invited for the hearing today uh, Mikhail Kashanov of the uh, Parnas uh, party, who is the president of the People's Democratic Union, who is a part of uh, uh, Parnas. Uh, Gary Kasparov uh, of the United Civic uh, uh, Front, who is the leader of the United Civic Front, and I, 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 had, I got the pleasure to, uh, to um, meet them both uh, at uh, minus six degrees on uh, Pushkin Square uh, a few, uh, a few uh, days ago. Um, uh, my proposal is that we start immediately by giving the floor to uh, uh, Mikhail Kashanov on on, on how uh, he is seeing what is uh, uh, happening uh, today in 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 uh, in Russia. What are the opportunities, and also what is very important for us, what we can do uh, as European Parliament and European institutions to push forward uh, the reform agenda uh, in in Russia, and then immediately after that to Gary Gasparov on the the, the same uh, topic. As you know, uh, we are discussing for the moment. Uh, between the political groups uh, a resolution on uh, that uh, issue uh, that normally uh, Christina has to be voted on Thursday, mm -hmm. on Wednesday, Thursday. on Thursday. And um, uh, certainly what can help us, uh, as the previous resolutions did already, I think, in, 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 in a number of developments in, in Russia. So I give immediately the floor to Mr. Uh, Kashanov. I'm very pleased that he is here. Thank you very much, Mr. Verhofstadt. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. For us, it's a great honor to be here with you and to share our views on what is going on in uh, our country, Russia, and how we stand now at the moment and what we are going to do in the foreseeable future. Uh, I think even in November, uh, nobody uh, could have imagined that in December, after the voting day and the Duma's election, uh, dozens of thousands of people would appear in the streets with the clear demand. With the clear demand, we want free and fair elections. That is absolutely new, new development in our country for 20 years since the collapse of Soviet Union, since the period of 90s. Uh, there were no such uh, massive manifestations in our country. It's appeared to be that it is a completely different um, situation, completely different people on the streets. Uh, that's not similar to what we uh, saw in uh, other countries. That is not poor people, unemployed people demanding for, for, for better material status. That is absolutely a different, a different part of society, middle class. Those people who have their cars, who have jobs, they already used to, to spend their time abroad just skiing on the European resorts or going just somehow just to warm, uh, warm seas, etc., etc. And these people simply demanded and now continue to demand free and fair elections. They demand respect to their constitutional rights. Uh, as a result, we analyzed and discussed um, with you here in the European Parliament in December just what happened in, uh, in the elections, so-called elections, elections um, to a Russian Parliament, Duma, lower house of the Parliament. And we very much appreciate those, that solidarity you've shown to us and that time adopting in December very clear and very principled resolution. Uh, assessing and uh, making, making the clear statement that elections to the Duma were not free, were not fair, and not in accordance with international standards, Russian government signed, off to, to be, uh, signed up to be obliged to. And uh, that is absolutely, absolutely clear message was heard in Russia uh, by the authorities, uh, and that was quite a difficult uh, or strong reaction on that. Some people were even even blamed for some kind of um, uh, being a spice of that, uh, that ugly West, etc. Et but uh, what we have today, we just passed presidential elections. Those elections were not for even for, 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 the, for the penny best than uh, the, previous, uh, the previous elections to, to the Duma. Uh, 
same same standards, uh, same uh, considerations should be applied to them. The elections were not free because independent uh, opposition uh, candidates of different opposition political forces were cut of elections. Only those people who were chosen by, personally by Mr. Putin were allowed to participate, and even, uh, even those who participated uh, couldn't uh, get an equal access to media and couldn't get uh, equal access to judiciary. And that's why even for these artificial, artificially chosen candidates, uh, uh, the, the, the campaign was not, was not fair. And uh, the third point, the third criteria, very important also, just the, um, the credibility of uh, counts. That's absolutely, absolutely uh, the dramatic and funny story. Simultaneously, thousands of civilian activists were, uh, deployed themselves as observers, and they saw a massive, massive, uh, without shying, massive falsifications during the whole day and night of this voting day. During the day, well, so, uh, such uh, a mechanism like with the name carousel was used when people voted, uh, thousands and thousands of people voted for, for several times, and that was organized by authority, by buses, uh, and uh, with all uh, uh, necessary support. And also, even uh, with the empty um, uh, ballot boxes, where a lot of uh, initial um, uh, ballot, ballot papers were, in, were introduced in the very beginning, that uh, that's was, uh, was dur uh, done during the daytime. And the night, protocols, protocols were changed, and uh, even observers from ODIR and um, the Parliamentary Assembly uh, just saw such, uh, such uh, uh, developments, negative developments, negative uh, uh, cases um, uh, and, uh, during that night, night of uh, 4th of March. As a result, there is no doubt for us, for uh, democratic opposition, that elections couldn't be judged by people and political forces as free and fair and credible. And, uh, Communist Party, just the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, party uh, in Russia, also uh, made such a decision that that elections, despite of the fact that we just in a difficult relations, I would say, with Communist Party, but despite that, we are, have a same assessment: democratic opposition and communist opposition that the elections were not free and fair. Uh, therefore, in fact, we have now not legitimate Duma we very soon will have not legitimate president. The whole government in Russia, the whole authority will be not legitimate. That is a dangerous situation for Russian state, the Russian Federation. What next? You know that uh, the protests continue. Some people say just yes, maybe the level of protest is reduced, but it's not really, I would say, disappointment and not a real uh, um, uh, loss of momentum. That's not the case. Now just we uh, having as a position, we have very clear, very clear picture what we need to do. Uh, for the remaining months of the year, we have to achieve uh, two things. One of them, political reform. Political reform uh, with the one only purpose, to make real political competition, free political activity, and to make all conditions for free elections. And press authorities to implement constitutional obligation to call for early elections. Same as you and Solidarity supported us in December, your December resolution, when you called Russian authorities to, to call for early elections. That's exactly our plan. Today, to respond to authority initiative to make a political reform, as it was designed at the moment, it, it looks like, like uh, semi-reform, like imitation, but with the amendments which we produced already submitted uh, to, to the authority, to President, to, to Mr. Medvedev, it could be a good piece, of, little but good piece of interaction between opposition and authority of uh, improving the whole environment in the country. Yesterday there was a working group which was established by, by Medvedev where just uh, our representatives presented our amendments uh, and we I would like to believe that uh, within two months that, we, that will be absolutely clear whether authorities are ready to hum, somehow to go to compromise with the opposition or authorities just imitate uh, some kind of response, positive response to those protests. 
That will be clear before, uh, before inauguration of Mr. Putin, before stepping in on the Kremlin. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that will be another uh, point when the massive demonstrations will take place in the beginning of May, uh, just in or prior to the day of inauguration. What we can expect from the regime? One, uh, one scenario is that uh, simply there is no concession given to opposition, and uh, Putin's regime will, will continue to squeeze the whole political environment. It means oppression of opposition. It means continue pressing just political opponents. It means uh, continue to implement, to apply anti so-called anti-extremism, anti extremist uh, uh, legislation against uh, civilian activists, etc., etc., etc. But I think just that is not that is not more realistic scenario because, because there is no such a power and, uh, and support and only few people around Mr. Putin could get such a responsibility to go together with him on such a scenario. Whether the second scenario could be some kind of um, uh, real uh, demontage, as my friend Mr. Kasparov likes to express, demontage of the regime and building up something different. Uh, so the set of liberal reforms. Is it possible to, 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 to see? I don't think it's possible because it's contrary to the whole understanding of Mr. Putin of the whole life, of the whole modern society, on the whole modern style of interaction in, in, uh, between nations in the world and what is democracy is about and uh, a different understanding what is a real need for the country, what country facing with they simply don't understand. That's why I don't think it's possible. The third scenario, to keep status quo, it means to imitate partially, to give little concession in one uh, side and uh, another concession on the other side. But it's the most, the most uh, I would say, um, uh, likely scenario uh, to take place. And therefore, even uh, yesterday's um, uh, discussion with uh, Medvedev's people, Putin's people, just show that they need some kind of minimum changes, but not general, not, not considerable. But therefore, uh, the protest movement will continue to take place. We, as a part of that, will uh, continue to explain people what our concrete goals should be. And our goals are on this stage, as I explained to you, just to implement those demands of demonstrators, uh, hundreds of thousands of demonstrators in December, and uh, uh, demand early elections to Duma. March next year, because the earliest opportunity is in December to announce a constitutional opportunity to announce early elections in December, to call them for March next year, and after that, just call for early presidential elections. Because the whole government is illegitimate, therefore we need real changes, we need real uh, public uh, debate, we need real public people's participation in, in uh, civilian and political life. That's what our goal is and we'll try and we're looking forward for all these necessary, necessary uh, attempts to, to do this. Our request to you is very simple. We need same level of solidarity you given to us in December. It means to make evaluation, to make your assessment by the, by the House that elections were not free and fair, same as you did in December. OD and other, and other observers already produced their reports. They are professional reports, they're not political reports. But now just your turn to make a political judgment on the basis of those reports provided to you in a professional manner. Elections were not free, not fair. That means uh, those reforms which announced could be real reforms if they come to agreement with the position. Thank you. I think what um, happened in March 4, and actually what ha has happened in Russia over the last three months, uh, was probably even more important we can uh, anticipate today. I think that was the end of mythology that uh, was a very important element of Putin's regime. And it worked nicely and effectively, not only inside Russia, but also outside Russia. Um, and this mythology was based on an assumption that Putin was immensely popular. And uh, no matter what uh, some um, small 
opposition groups, noisy opposition groups, uh, have been doing in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and few big cities. These kind of actions never had the support of Russians. And uh, some of the political pundits and politicians, they resigned to the theory that Russians, as a nation, uh, were not mature to enjoy the fruits of democracy. That was a concept which uh, uh, gave an upper hand for those uh, who has been pra have been practicing the policy of appeasement over years. Without naming names, I think they are well known, both uh, uh, here in Europe or across the Atlantic. These beliefs have been shattered uh, after massive protest uh, in, in December. But uh, I could see and I could smell, by uh, just visiting the European Parliament today, that these forces that have been advocating Vladimir Putin for many years, they are on the rise again. They're trying to prove that what's happened in Russia in the last three months was just a hiccup, was just an accident that should be forgotten, and we all have to succumb to another six years of Vladimir Putin in the office. I think I have a bad news for these guys, that you know, people in Russia are not going to tolerate Vladimir Putin for six months, for six years. For six months, maybe. <laughs> Sorry. That's a, yeah, probably it's you know, I'm under the pressure of Dr. Freud. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, it's, um, we, may, uh, we may keep arguing about the, uh, the results of these elections and you know, what, was the, you know, what were the true numbers behind Putin's self-proclaimed victory. What we know, what we saw already, there was a massive fraud. And if Putin was so popular, why not to show up at the public debate? And by the way, those were not public debates with Mikhail Kasyanov or Gary Kasparov or Boris Nemtsov or Alexei Navalny. He could debate against his own picks. You know, four clowns that were allowed to participate. And by the way, those four candidates during the campaign never criticized Vladimir Putin. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure they ever mentioned his name. So he acted like Voldemort. He, his name should not be mentioned. Uh, still, even with those four, Putin didn't show up for the debate. The press and, and television was dominated. We may argue whether Putin occupied 85 or 90 percent of all the time, but he, he was all over the place. It was a 24-7 uh, operation of all Russian authorities, from Kremlin to the uh, municipality in the middle of nowhere in Siberia to brainwash Russian people and to force them to vote for Putin. They used every dirty trick in the book. They have been talking about Putin being the only alternative to the war. They have been presenting Putin as, the, as, as, the, as God's gift to, to, to resurrect Mother Russia, to save Russians from hunger. I mean, just, I mean he, he got more you know, more um, qualities, positive qualities than probably all Russian Tsars and, 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 and uh, uh, leaders all together. And one of, the, one of the slogans that have been carried by the Putin union was, Putin likes you all. It seems that he acted like Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, and even despite all these operations, despite all the pressure and the total control, he still needed massive fraud on March 4. We even not talking about Chechnya with 99% turnout and 99% of the vote for Putin. And by the way, if somebody you know, um, has enough stamina and, and, uh, and uh, um, patience, you can download these web cameras reports, because Putin, in order to, to demonstrate his willingness to organize transparent elections, he, he spent tons of money from the budget for the web, web cameras, uh, knowing that it would, wouldn't have a massive effect. But, but some of our activists who were patient, and uh, um, I think they, just, they were willing to torture themselves, they downloaded these reports from the Chechen polling stations just to, to figure out that the, uh, that the turnout was just over 40%. On these web cameras, we saw enough, but it was still a very small portion. Because what's happened that the, the government came up with new, more sophisticated ways of cheating people and the rest of the world. It was not simply rewriting the protocols, also they did it. 
It's not just the carousels, as, as Mr. Kisyanov just described, when people were buzzing from station to station. And they were recorded. They were caught. Unfortunately, any time our activist, whether it was in Moscow or somewhere else, caught these criminals, the police always rushed to rescue them. Some of these actions are even recorded on, on Putin's web, uh, web cameras. And again, it, there's so many that it's impossible within 10 days to come up with a comprehensive report. Only Mikhail Prokhorov's observers, the, 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 the Campbell observers, recorded more than 4,000 violations. We're not counting communists. They didn't come up with full numbers. And there were independent observers that, 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 that came up with, with, with similar reports. I was also an observer in the mobile group. I can tell you that at the, voting, at the polling station I voted, in the center of Moscow, that Putin made 32.5%. That's a result I saw with my own eyes. 413 votes, Prokhorov had 420 votes. Uh, that was clean. So um, we do not have yet the numbers, but it's very, very clear to us that Vladimir Putin, with all the massive fraud, with all the support, he has not crossed the magic mark of 50 plus 1, and he knows that. His supporters, through their teeth, telling now, oh, OK, maybe it was not 63.6, .6, but it was 53, maybe 10% was stolen. Just imagine, they are publicly recognizing that 10%, which means 7 million votes have been stolen. And they, as if, you know, so big deal. No, 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 not 7 million. It was much more, and they know that. It's like the criminal who is willing to accept a light crime of stealing something, not to be accused of murder. So they know that if it's a full-scale investigation, we'll find out much more. Putin's result in Moscow is not 48%, but about 36 to 37. We have enough data to prove it. St. Petersburg is not 58.7, but it's at the range of 46 to 47. As for other cities, we have still great difficulty of analyzing it, but enough to call that Putin is illegitimate. Just one number we saw, official number, we saw from a remote region in the Far East. It's, it's a Vladivostok area. Some of the uh, forest, uh, it's a forest areas with no carousels because it's far away and, and, and no, uh, no um, extra, extra voters could be bust there. Putin's results were ranging from 35 to 41 percent. Also, the greatest uh, uh, opening idea you know, showing the, how inventive are people when they have to steal in Russia it was the so-called extra polling stations. Just a few days before the elections, they came up with extra polling stations. Only in Moscow, there are 23. 23 extra polling stations. One of them was assigned to a maternity house, and it was open 23 kilometers away. Yeah, you can guess that at this polling station, Putin had 87% of the vote. Yeah, uh, and I, don't, I think I, you know, I have to stop because you know, just going over it, it just doesn't make you know, uh, uh, much sense. We'll eventually, we, it was the next few weeks, we'll come up with a report. And this report will prove beyond any reasonable doubt that Vladimir Putin is illegitimate. And that, by the way, was a clear message. Came from the, from the meetings on the 5th and especially on the 10th, when, a meeting on March 10th, the 10th in the center of Moscow, where the, the podium, the stage, was given not to the VIPs, but mainly to the young people who were observers who came up with their own stories showing how they, could, uh, how they saw the fraud and how they were trying to, 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 to fight it. And uh, the, uh, the, the uh, slogan of the meeting, and now this is the slogan of Russian opposition, this was not the elections. Putin is not the president. And we're going to fight. This is not that we're going to lay down and wait for another six years. We're not going to give you such a luxury. And I think that many politicians in Europe and some of the members of European Parliament, they think that they can pass this responsibility to oppose a dictator, the, 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 uh, 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 an aging dictator, to, to, the, to the next generation of, of, the parliamentary, of the members of the Parliament here in Europe. No, it's not going to happen. Because we saw the dramatic rise of Russian middle class. And when somebody says that there are only 20,000 people attended the last rally, just, you know, here again, only 20,000 people. The nucleus of Russian protest was about 1,000 people prior to December 4. It's, it grew up 20 times. It's a nucleus. And these people actually had what, about 25,000 in, 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 uh, um, in Nova Arbat on March 10, and about 20,000 on, on um, March 5, just immediately after, after uh, 
uh, election, so-called elections on, on March 4. And these people are showing so much creativity. It's an amazing, an amazing power of, we we'll call it the crowd, it's crowd outsourcing with the fantasy, you know, and when Putin says a word, hundreds of words, hundreds of jokes coming back. You know, Putin kept saying they don't rock the boat. And people came up with a great slogan, don't rock the boat, our rat is seasick. So it it's shows that they are not willing to tolerate him. And the first meeting, which was for free and fair elections, gradual, gradually changed for Putin must go. The people are chanting for Russia without Putin, for Russia without Putin. And uh, uh, Putin's desperate attempt to mobilize, to rally people behind him, they, that, that was another sign of weakness because he couldn't collect hundreds of thousands of people of true supporters. He has been bringing people from all over the country. Even Western television st uh, 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 studios, the Fox News, uh, CNN, Al Jazeera, they were recording how these people were actually counting, counting money that they were given for, for, uh, for participation uh, in, in, in pro-Putin's rallies and for chanting you know, something about Putin. By the way, just you know, to give you a clear indication of the quality of the meetings, we had all these meetings with hundreds of thousands of people at top, no, no act of violence, no act of violence, no burned cars, no broken windows, no garbage. Imagine, you have hundreds of thousands of people in Moscow, no garbage. After Putin's, pro Putin's rally and Manage Square, they spent one day cleaning from the garbage, dirty, uh, 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 dirty paper, and, and empty bottles. This is, this is about the quality of people. And when they say that these meetings are, are um, um, disturbing Moscow population, that's what they said yesterday. And now they're contemplating another law to, to severe the rules for people to get together, as if our constitutional rights have not been hampered already. Uh, it's not because, uh, because of us, and uh, Mr. Verhofstadt can, can confirm. The, on March 5, we have more troops in Russia, in the center of our capital, in, in Moscow, that, that, than, than we saw since 1993, when there was the clash between Yeltsin and the, and the parliament. They occupied the center of the city. They cut most of the streets. If, if, if Putin is so popular, why does he need tens of thousands of troops, including the specially trained groups to fight terror? to oppose unarmed people. People that never, never committed one act of violence. People who publicly said, we would stick to non-violent resistance. And we accomplished something that was unheard in Russia, that all the different groups, the liberals, the left wing, nationalists, they're all getting together under different banners, but they all are united by the one simple demand, Putin must go. Because we don't believe that anything Anything in Russia can be changed if Putin st is staying there because he is a, a, like a focal point which, which brings together all the ills and all the evils of the system that is related uh, to, to, uh, to his name. Um, and uh, what, we, what we ask here in Europe, so um, it's not necessarily you know, the declaration of support because we believe that it's Russian business to build a free and democratic country. What we have been asking for a long time is stop providing Vladimir Putin and his regime with democratic credentials. Don't give him any moral ground to call himself a legitimate president. Russian people are looking around not for, uh, not for a support, a material support, but for West for Europe and for the United States to stand firm on the ground of human rights and democracy. Don't apply these double standards. And uh, uh, don't wait until Putin shed blood on the Russian streets. Don't wait until he is using brute force as a last stand against, against people of Russia. Because that can happen, and then I think you will feel extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And, uh, um, I think that's looking at the resolution that you, you, are, you are about to pass here. You cannot do time and again a, a piece of paper threatening warning of warning. It should be warning of action. And it's very clear that Putin is quite sensitive. He's quite sensitive to so-called Magnitsky list. He's quite sensitive to anything which can hurt his cronies. Because at the end of the day, 
it's not him who will execute the criminal orders, but others. And the best thing you can do, I've said it many times, is to have an open-ended Magnitsky list, where there will be enough room for others who may commit uh, 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 crimes. And made it very, very clear that you are not interfering in Russian domestic affairs, but you are standing firm on the ground of Russia's respecting its own ob international obligations and basic human rights. No brute force should be used in the streets of Moscow, because we are coming back. There will be more people in the Russian streets. It may not lead to an immediate overthrow of Putin's regime, but he is weak. He knows he is weak. He is using force more and more often, and he is sending signals inside Russia that he would not, he would not agree on any compromise. This word, com compromise or concession, does not belong to his political vocabulary. So any, any clear sign from Europe that you will not tolerate the use of brute force, you will not tolerate Vladimir Putin uh, uh, shooting Russian people who are demanding political reform, will be, I think, a very important step towards building free and, in, free and uh, um, democratic Russia, which inevitably will become the part of, the, of this united Europe at the time when we can uh, uh, say that we all share the same the same uh, uh, um, convictions and uh, the same respect for, uh, for law, law and order. Thank you. Can I say what a <clears throat> pleasure and a privilege it is to share a platform with uh, not just uh, my colleagues from the European Parliament, but also uh, Michael Kazyanov and Guy Kasparov, and to welcome the other groups uh, in the European Parliament who are here present today, because this is a process which should involve us all. Russia is a big neighbor. Russia is a potentially dangerous country, as Mr. Kasparov has just said. We should be frightened of the future, as Russians are. And the question I pose today is to what extent can the European Parliament, the European Union, and indeed the other European institutions like the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, the ECHR, OSCE, ODIA, play a part in restraining what is taking place in Russia, which is clearly a decline into managed democracy and worse. And uh, I had the pleasure of speaking on Garry Kasparov's platform in 2006 at the other Russia conference in July, when the Nashi, first of all, began their rather brutal uh, tactics towards uh, the democratic process. He's courageously gone on since then, uh, raising the issue, raising the standard of democracy and human rights, and challenging the Putin regime. And uh, Michael Kazyanov, who was himself a prime minister in the early 2000s, at a time when we had hope that Russia was on the track to reform, now is as active as anybody else in persuading us and demonstrating that that is no longer the case. So, the elections on March the 4th were a travesty. We will see in due course uh, the reports by the international observers. My first observation is that the European Union was not present, and it should have been. The European Parliament was not present, and it should have been. We need to change the mechanisms under which we operate, um, because the approach we're taking is too bureaucratic based as it is on United Nations propositions. I believe that the instruments that we have under our control, and I was the founder of the European Instrument for Democracy and Human Rights, which does run programs in Russia, but it tends to cooperate with the authorities. It should no longer do so. We should be supporting reform and not business as usual. And uh, talking about civil society and so on allows the European Commission to feel comfortable about spending money in Russia, but to no real effect. We should go back to the process under which we were an unsafe partner for dictatorships, an unsafe partner for autocrats like Putin. We are discussing today in the House the creation of a European Endowment for Democracy. That is absolutely necessary. It's over time. The resources to reformists. I'm, we don't have that mechanism. We should create it. And 
the National Endowment for Democracy in Washington is our model. When it comes to other European institutions, uh, we look at, for example, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. But there, Mr. Putin's nominees, the Stooges from the Duma, sit alongside my former colleagues in the Conservative Party. So it's hardly surprising that Mr. Cameron was one of the first people to call Mr. Putin to say, jolly good show, because they're political partners. So we need to stop this business as usual. We need to stop the process under which Russia is seen as a normal country. It is no longer a normal country. And all the mechanisms we have should be devoted to trying to isolate the regime, to highlight its deficiencies, and to try and reward and encourage the reformists who are represented on this platform today, and many millions like them, who actually want a clean Russia, a Russia that works, not only for its own sake, but because of the process underway in which Russia and China in particular are trying to reshape the world order so that the process of what they regard as democracy is a mere sham. And of course, it's fair to say that China is a far worse transgressor in this regard than Russia. But they're working together. And this must be isolated and highlighted by the European Union in particular, because we do have some instruments to deploy. We are discussing this partnership and cooperation agreement. I believe that we should look very carefully now at whether that's of any value at all. And the strategic partnership between the European Union and Russia simply does not deserve to exist when Russia quite clearly is moving down the autocratic path. So I hope this meeting today can provide some practical solutions as to the way forward. And I perfectly understand the criticisms of our resolutions, as indeed last uh, summer, uh, Christina and myself and Guy were in Moscow with Mikhail, Mikhail and others on a platform where Sergei Kovalyov was brutally critical of the statements made by our own um, Kathy Ashton, Mr. Van Rompuy, Mr. Barroso. My motto today is no longer business as usual. Thank you very much. There are international obligations of this government, and this government just breach and breaching these obligations. That is your, that's your obligation to condemn, not fulfillment of that. That's what language we want, but that, therefore I'm saying just at least what we need, the clear words. Elections were not free, were not fair. Results are not credible. That's three was at least just would cover as a, a general assessment of, of, of that what we have in Russia now in terms of elections. On uh, other questions, uh, European Parliament and what uh, just we with the, Ms. Kasparov tried to explain to you just how we would like to see uh, further business with the Russian government. Not be, no business as usual. Therefore it means it means you should not try just to uh, improve your relations with the, this authority, just uh, feeling yourself defeated. That's not a way to how, how to do this. My recommendation would be very clear. Uh, the fact is that uh, uh, Putin is losing legitimacy inside Russia, and he needs additional source of, source of legitimacy. Kissing and hugging Putin and inviting to European Parliament and listening to him, that is the source of legitimacy. Turning, coming back to Russia, the whole propaganda will describe for 150 Russians. That is, the world is like Putin design. Everything is the same. These people applaud to speeches of Mr. Putin in European Parliament, the heart of Europe. That's what he dreams about that. If you, you, you do this, you'll be completely contrary to all those principled uh, positioning and those values we all share. That is my absolutely clear, and, uh, and that's what I'm trying to explain each time when I see each of you all together in uh, different groups. Just <laughs> stop kissing. <laughs> uh, uh, what to do with the illegitimate president? I understand, I, understand, I understand how it is difficult, how it is difficult to do, because I was in the power and was in authority. I understand just uh, everybody should be responsible. And uh, you're right. With Duma, that's absolutely easier thing, because, because in, uh, in accordance with the Russian constitution, that's not the main body. It doesn't 
do any serious business. You can forget about this because it's not legitimate agency, not a legitimate body, and just uh, the, to continue some kind of relations with this Duma, I think it's irrelevant simply. President, that is the, the source of power, real source of power in Russia, even if it is leg illegitimate. Therefore, I'm telling you, we're trying to pick up any opportunity to fight not revolution, non-revolutionary development. That's why the interaction with this government, with the president, it seems to be relevant at this stage. Although Medvedev is not real president, and simply just a senior assistant of Mr. Putin, temporarily occupying the post of president. But we understand we have a dialogue with Putin. And we still have this chance under the pressure of these protests. Maybe they will come to compromises and uh, do something. It will start gradually building up the exit strategy for Mr. Putin and his team, which could be acceptable. We don't want revolution, and that's what we're trying to do. To, we're building up this fence to prevent revolution and let these people just uh, build, uh, build, uh, build up the, themselves just the, the exit strategy. Therefore, I think just no kisses, no hugs, no source of no, no legitimacy. But of course, uh, uh, there is country with this legitimate government, and this government has obligations. And just to control implementation of these international obligations, that's the important part. And human rights, respect of human rights, that's number one international obligation of this authority. Um, yeah. Picking up what from Mr. Kasyanov said, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, um, I mean, the resolution is watershed. It's, uh, it's not worth a piece of paper it's written on. Uh, it doesn't even mention Putin by name. Um, and uh, I think it's just, you made a very good point by, 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 by and uh, Mr. Kasyanov elaborated on that, um, uh, that Putin's meeting with other foreign leaders was always a very important source of his legitimacy. It always provided him with, with vital democratic credentials. I remember the, the so-called G8 meeting, which in Russia we called uh, the G7 plus one, in 2006 in St. Petersburg, uh, where Putin had all the world democratic leaders. The Russian television was trumpeting the greatest victory because it was a demonstration that while the bunch of Ma marginalized extremists are trying to protest on the streets, Putin is surrounded by Blair, Bush, Chirac, Schroeder. They're all over there. So what's the point of, 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 of making, of making any, any noise? I'm not sure, was Schroeder or Merkel? Uh, I'm not, but probably Schroeder. But it's, it's, it was a huge success for Putin's propaganda. And now, he will be definitely looking for any, any sign of support. The biggest news on Russian, on Russian uh, uh, radio t two days ago, Obama called Putin and congratulated him. This is the biggest news. Now, after all the criticism of America, Obama called Putin. Sarkozy, I mean, they picked up every call and they put it you know, on, uh, on, 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 on a special attention window. Watch, they called Putin. So inviting him to the European Parliament, <sighs> would be, I don't know, what a crime or mistake. You can just uh, you know, identify it. But it will be definitely uh, 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 a greatest gift for Putin's, for Putin's uh, uh, um, stolen, stolen elections. And uh, you know, looking for the resolution text, again, I, I, I understand that Europe must deal with Russia no matter who is in, in charge. The same way Europe has been doing business with China. You are not sending congratulations to Chinese communist leaders when one of them is elected. No, oh, but you, the amount of business Europe has been doing with China is dozens of times bigger than Russia. But you are not calling them Democrats. So business, of course, WTO, of course, those are the things that are vital for the interest of the countries you are representing. But not bringing him in as one of the equals. Not, not give him the legitimacy he needs so badly. And there's a clear example in Europe. It's Belarus. It's a country between Russia and most of the Europe. And uh, I think Europe was not shy to call Lukashenko a dictator and to act. If Putin acts like Lukashenko, he should treat it like Lukashenko. 
You know, those, it's, it, the, the, no double standards can be applied when we talk about uh, a value of human life. Russians, Russian people will take care of Vladimir Putin. Just send him a message that opposition must be respected and uh, he can do the business the way he wants, providing he does not violate the most important right, right of people, the right for life and for, self, you know, for their ability to, to, to express themselves. And uh, quickly about the positive program, the question that was asked. Um, I think we have a positive program when we demand free and fair elections, the freedom of speech, the freedom of associations. And I think it's amazing that all Russian political groups from the opposition, they are no longer arguing about so-called third way. The ideas of liberal democracy have been fully adopted by all groups in Russia, including the left wing and the nationalist. And I think this is a fundamental shift from the 90s. Now, as for a joint program on saving the country, I don't believe you can do that because the moment we start arguing about social reforms or taxes, it will, you know, will, will, will split. So you cannot imagine that uh, uh, all the EPP, socialists, and Greens will come up with one unified program on everything. I think we in Russia, we accomplish a lot by bringing people under the umbrella of liberal democracy. This is our program. And we agreed that all the quarrels, all the arguments will be left for the parliament. When we have free and fair elections, you will see Russian parliament fighting each other, kicking each other, arguing about everything, but it will be within the walls of the parliament. It will be no longer uh, um, a, 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 a supreme source of power that will be deciding on, on, on the future of our country. And if you ask my personal opinion about the future of Russia, from what I heard by talking to very different factions of Russian opposition, I think that if we have free and fair elections and Russian parliament votes for the constitution and for the future structure of Russian government, uh, Russia may turn, may turn into the parliamentary republic, more likely into the country with a very weak presidency. People are sick and tired of super, power, super powerful presidency. They believe that the president you know, may acquire some power, but not, not to decide who is uh, 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 running the government. Yes, before we continue, I'd like to give um, uh, once again floor to Edward Macmillan Scott, as long as he has to go to the other duties, but please, Edward. Thank you, Chris. I've got to go to another meeting, but uh, I'd like to pick up the concept of what we do in the Parliament. Uh, some years ago, when I became Vice President for Human Rights and Democracy, um, I began an all-party campaign to try and focus on the problems in China before the Olympics. Now, there's an entirely different feeling about China in the European Parliament. People are well-informed, uh, they've been engaged, and so on. I think the time has come to create some sort of cross-party Russia monitoring group to keep colleagues informed, to keep colleagues motivated, so that the next time there's a resolution on China, it is not the rather weak words that has been criticized today and we've criticized before. We need a well-informed European Parliament, especially those colleagues who've been through the Soviet system or lived under it, who really know what they're talking about, but those of us who haven't also feel motivated. So if you would agree, uh, Michael and Gary, to work with Christina and myself and our staff across the parliament to try and have some mechanism that can take this forward so that you've got a sounding board, you can tell us what's going on, and we can respond from here. Yes, this is a good idea, and this uh, is like a little continuity of this uh, early monitoring um, uh, group that we created uh, approximately one and a half years ago in this house, and this is also across uh, uh, group or cross-party uh, body what uh, started to work uh, uh, already before, long before the Duma elections, and uh, we have been trying to observe the situation. And uh, thanks to that uh, inter-party group in the, inside this house, all these uh, four resolutions basically born last year in, in this uh, plenary. But thank you very much, Edward, for this proposal. I think we should uh, consider this, and uh, we go back uh, to the colleagues in different groups with this.